discussion of Sea of Scandals, hosted by the Frontline Club. Um, I'm Jonathan Leake, for 25 years the Environment Editor of the Sunday Times, now freelance, but also long before all that happened, uh, a marine biologist. So nearly 40 years ago, I took a degree in uh, oceanography and marine biology, which included a year on the Isle of Man. That's where I lived, through, that's where, and when I was out there, I lived in what was then a small fishing village and a tourism Maybe a, maybe a tourist centre, but uh, a lot of fishing still going on, and also a marine biology centre for Liverpool University. And that's where I also learned to scuba dive. Um, so I was struck then, in that year in Port Area on the Isle of Man, by the closeness of the community we were living in, and how the sea and the activities based around it brought people together. But I was also struck by the site when scuba diving of seabeds that had been badly damaged uh, and smashed up by fishing boats. So fishing meant incomes and community and prosperity for some, but at the cost of a lot of damage to wildlife. Um, and damage is pretty much invisible because it was hidden beneath the sea, where only people like me who were diving would, would really ever see it. So those conflicts between human needs and conservation have been around for decades perhaps since the, the invention of steam-powered fishing boats. And conservationists and fishing communities and politicians have been arguing over how to solve them for almost as long. Um, the latest attempt at that centres partly on marine protected areas, parts of the ocean where fishing is restricted. And um, we've heard some news today about how those sorts of areas can work with the news that blue whale populations appear to be recovering in the Southern Ocean. There's more to it than just marine protected areas. It's also levels of fishing and not killing them and so on. But it gives a sense of what can be achieved. Um, that marine protected areas are a part of a much wider debate, which also takes in Brexit, also a subject which rouses passionate feelings. Um, back in 2015, George Eustace made the following pledge. If we act decisively and leave, we will regain control and have the power to deliver the change our fishing industry so craves. In five years time, now, the only question we will ask ourselves is why didn't we do it sooner? Well, it's five years later and as with most things related to fisheries for the last few decades, the answer is still somewhere in the future. So here tonight we've got three speakers we hope can point us towards at least the answers they would like. So we're going to be hearing from Elspeth MacDonald, Chief Executive of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation. She grew up in a coastal community from the Isle of Mull and also took a, took a degree in marine fisheries science. And um, she's told Fishing News recently that she wants Scottish boats to get far more quota after Brexit. It's an interesting position because her industry employs about 5,000 people in Scotland. It's about 0.2% of the Scottish economy. Um, but they rely also on exports to France. So there's another 5,000 people in Boulogne in France processing the landings from those Scottish boats. It gives you a sense of how intertwined they are and how many people rely, rely on it. And then we're going to hear from Barry Dees, who's Chief Executive of the National Federation of Fishermen's Organisations. He's called for caution in the introduction of marine protected areas and criticised Greenpeace for its recent stunt of dropping boulders across the Dogger Bank. Um, to deter trawling in a, in a conservation area. And he's even questioned whether that the Dogger Bank should even have that designation. Um, but Barry has in general been a very re well-reasoned and well-informed um, representative of the fishing industry and has played a key part in much of the thinking going on in government. And finally, we'll hear from Charles Clover, whose book of some years ago now, but still equally valid, uh, starts out by pointing out that sweeping a huge weighted net across the plains of Africa and catching lions, elephants and rhinos while smashing up the ground and uprooting every plant and tree would never be accepted on land. But despite this an identical activity, trawling, he says, is carried out every single day of the year in the, in the world's oceans. He's a powerful advocate for marine protected areas and wants more of them with stronger protection in each. So what we're guaranteed tonight is probably not a meeting of minds, but we may at least have a fascinating debate. Elspeth, you've, I've seen you've just tuned in. Can you hear me okay? Hello, Elspeth. 
Bye. Oh, you've gone silent. Oh, I'm muted again. Sorry. Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I don't know if you heard the beginning of what I was saying, but I actually put you first on the list of speakers. Are you happy ah. to jump straight in? <laughs> I am. I will. I just have some quite short introductory comments to make. I was going to ask, actually, if you could start just for the sake of the audience who may not all be familiar with who's who, if you could just set out uh, who you represent and a little a few key facts about your industry so that we can kind of get a, sure. a bedrock for what's to follow and also it'd be quite interesting to make the point of how you differ how the scottish fishing industry differs from the english one yeah sure i'm what i can cover yours? all of that Thank you. I can I can cover all of that. So um, I'm Elspeth MacDonald. Um, I'm the chief executive of the Scottish Fishermen's Federation, and I have been in this role for um, something in the region of about 18 months now. So uh, I've certainly joined this uh, industry and this job at, at a very uh, interesting and fast moving time. Um, the Scottish Fishermen's Federation is a, a, con a democratically constituted industry group. Uh, it was set up in 1973 and its key aims are to uh, protect and promote the collective interests of our constituent associations um, to ensure that um, there is a viable and sustainable future for the fleet, both in terms of economics and environmental responsibility, and that we work to improve the perception of the fishing industry attracting uh, new entrants and ensuring professional uh, standards of, of, of training and safety in the industry. Uh, and I would absolutely emphasize safety there. This can be a, a hazardous industry. Um, so there are eight constituent associations within the Federation and uh, that represents uh, around, uh, I think it's about 450 vessels within uh, that membership. And that represents a very wide range of fishing businesses, both uh, inshore and offshore, and catching a, a very wide range of, of fish and shellfish species. So thinking a bit more um, broadly about the, the Scottish industry, um, the most recent uh, statistics, the Scottish Sea Fishery Statistics for 20, were published for 2019. They're done on an annual basis. And um, for Scotland as a whole, in 2019, we had just over 2,000 uh, fishing vessels, 2,098, I believe, and about 75% of those were smaller vessels in the under 10 meter category, and about 25% are larger vessels uh, over, over 10 meters. Um, we have just under 5,000 active um, fishers in Scotland, mostly men, but not wholly. We have some, uh, some female fishers. And uh, so that number of about 5,000 represents uh, people who are uh, regularly employed or engaged in, in commercial fishing. In terms of um, the contribution that the, the Scottish part of the industry makes to the UK as a whole, um, I guess Scotland punches a bit above its weight in, in population terms uh, when you look at fishing. Um, the, total uh, tonnage of, of fish landed by Scottish vessels and also the value of the uh, catch landed by Scottish vessels. Both of these account for about 60% of the UK totals. So, so we are uh, a, a big part of the UK industry. And um, our industry essentially fishes across the, the, the whole range of, of different stocks, shellfish stocks, uh, whitefish, demersal fish, so the, the fish that live um, close, close to the bottom, the white fish like cod and haddock, um, and also pelagic fish, so the, the, the midwater um, migratory species such as, as uh, mackerel and herring. And uh, in terms of the most important uh, parts of the of the Scottish industry. In terms of value, the most valuable species uh, would be mackerel. That makes up uh, just over a quarter of the, the total value of, of the Scottish catch. Uh, the, most, the second most important species and, and the most important shellfish species uh, would be nephrops, the, 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 the prawns. And then um, in whitefish, um, if you take haddock, cod and monkfish together, they account for about 20% of, of the total value of, of fish landed. 
um, by, by the, the Scottish vessels. So in, um, in Scotland last year, the, the value at first landing uh, of our uh, catch was, was just under um, 0.6 billion. And as I say, Scottish vessels account for around 60% of both value and landings of all fish caught by, by UK vessels. And I would say uh, at the start, the fishing industry needs to have sustainable fisheries. Uh, the people who are in this industry are, are in it for the long term. This is, this is not an industry of, of ephemeral businesses. And I think one of the things that struck me most when I came into this job was just the uh, the extent to which many of the businesses involved in fishing in Scotland have been involved in fishing for generations. Uh, as I say, they're not in it for the short term and they want to pass these businesses on to future generations in good heart. And for those businesses to remain sustainable, uh, they, need to, they need to have sustainable fisheries. And I think our industry has a, a, a good track record in working with governments and with other stakeholders to, to enhance and, and improve sustainability and, and to improve the way that we are able to, to catch fish and make sure that we've got sustainable industry for the future. So for example, we have invested a significant effort into trialing and testing different types of fishing gears to improve selectivity. And Scotland has been um, very proactive in, for example, prohibiting the use of certain types of gear and certain types of configurations of, of net and twine um, that can be used legally elsewhere in Europe, but, but which we don't allow to be used in Scotland. We um, just recently published uh, an updated environmental policy statement, which is available uh, on our website and contains a, a great deal more detailed information about a number of the initiatives that, that we are involved with. And this would include, for example, um, with funding that we have um, been fortunate to have from the Scottish Government uh, and the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, um, for over 10 years now we have been running a, an independent fishery onboard observer scheme and this has allowed industry data to contribute to scientific stock assessment and to the uh, the stock assessments that are undertaken by the international councils of the exploration of the seas and has also supported industry-led schemes to, to improve fishing gear selectivity so just touching for a moment on on fishery science I would just say fishery science is, is not an exact science and fishery scientists wouldn't dispute that. Fishery science contains a great many uncertainties uh, and assumptions and many of those assumptions are, are made rightly on a, on a precautionary basis. And it's easy to assume that the numbers are accurate but, but really they're not and there are high degrees of uncertainty. And I think then it's important that we sometimes step away from the detailed numbers and the fluctuations that we see in scientific advice year to year and, and focus, focus actually on the trends. Elspeth, can I just jump in there for one quick? So given we've got just an hour, what I'd like to do now is, is to move you onto the very specific topics, fit, it, fitting into that excellent framework you set out of um, marine protected areas, uh, the fisheries bill and Brexit. In other words, we've got some, we've got a push for con by conservationists for marine protected areas. What are they? What should they be trying to do and how might your members respond to them? And then putting that into the wider context of Brexit and Br British uh, attempts to protect and safeguard its own waters. Yep, sure. Um, well, we work very closely uh, with the Scottish Government and other stakeholders on marine protected areas. There's a, a pretty extensive uh, network of protections that, that are in place. There are a number of, of pieces of legislation that, um, that require protection of species habitats or, or pr uh, priority marine features. And we have worked uh, very closely with, with the Scottish Government to um, in terms of the designation of those areas and, and the, the management measures around them. And I think what we have been very keen to promote and ensure is that the designation and the management measures of, of MPAs are based on evidence. And for example, I think there can be a, um, a perception perhaps in the public's mind that a marine protected area is an area where no, no fishing or other types of commercial activity can take place. And that is very much not the case. It is about, um, ensuring that the management measures that are in place for a particular protected area are appropriate for whatever that area is set up to protect. 
but that there can be a, 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 a an appropriate balance between conservation and 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 commercial activity that that could take place there. The um, I think the linkage with the Fisheries Bill is is really important. Uh, the Fisheries Bill is the new piece of legislation on the statute book in in the UK. If if it hasn't yet received royal assent, it will be very close to that point. And that. Um, I think sustainability is at the heart of that fish bill. There are, I think, eight or nine uh, fisheries objectives set out on the face of the bill. And I think it is either five or six of these uh, relate very specifically to sustainability. So I think the fisheries bill provides us now with the right legislative framework for the future for us to have the right arrangements in place for the UK. So all of that links, obviously, inextricably to Brexit because it is the UK's exit from the, um, from the EU and therefore our exit from the common fisheries policy that requires us to have a new set of legislation in the UK for how we manage our fisheries. And I think, I think it, is, it is very apparent through the bill and the work that has gone forward to develop that bill is that this needs to be a collaborative process involving government, involving industry, involving other stakeholders. And I think as we go forward developing the fisheries management plans that will flow from that bill, uh, there's going to be a lot of work to do to make sure that we've got a, 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 a real sort of co-management and, and co-production of what those fisheries management plans look like. Many thanks, Elspeth. Sorry, I muted myself temporarily there. Um, one quick question with an answer that could be as long as you want, but I beg you to keep it short, which is you use the word sustainable a great deal there. And sustainable is one of those magic words that means lots of different things to different people. Some years ago, I can remember asking DEFRA what their definition was after they published a paper, uh, mentioning it many times, and they didn't actually know what it meant. They had no definition. And hopefully things have moved on since then. Um, but I note that the sustainability clause in the fisheries bill was actually, uh, as a primary objective, removed and then put back in. So it was, there's controversy over it still. But what, what do you mean from a fisherman's uh, organisation's perspective by sustainability? What does it actually mean in practical terms? Well, I think uh, looking at it in the context of, of the fisheries bill, I, I think what's important is that the when we talk about sustainability, we're balancing all three pillars of sustainability. So we have environmental sustainability, we have social sustainability, and we have um, economic sustainability. And it's about, I think, through the bill, making sure that these things are, are applied in, in balance. And if I think, if I'm, I'm just looking here at the document I mentioned, our environmental policy statement, which I would um, recommend to, to anybody who wants to read a bit more about this, we say at, a, at, its, at its simplest form, sustainability can be defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising and perhaps improving the ability of future generations to meet theirs. And I think that's, that's exactly what we're trying to achieve here, ensuring that we can have environmental sustainability with a sustainable industry, sustainable communities benefiting from, from both of those things, not just now, but also into the future. Okay. Many thanks for that, Elspeth. Um, Barry, we're going to, I'm not quite sure where you came in. Did you hear the running order? Because you're next, if you don't mind. So being. Well, I'm here. <laughs> Good to see you again, by the way. And um, thanks for joining us. Um, well, if, you, if perhaps you could follow the same structure and just very briefly set out who, who, you're, who you are and your what your organisation is and who you represent. Just because a lot of people don't quite realise the distinctions, possibly even between Scottish and English, um, and certainly between who your members are and um, the fact that um, I think some of your members are foreign owners of British quota and so on. So if you could very briefly set that out, I'd be very grateful. And then we can address the issue of marine protected areas and their future role. I've seen your criticisms of some of them. and I'm interested in hearing about that. Okay. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the chief executive of the NFFO, and um, uh, we represent fishermen and fishing vessel operators in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, so in, uh, in the UK generally, there's uh, about um, uh, fi uh, 
5,500 vessels, um, of which um, 3,500 are England and Wales, um, but 7,000 fishermen uh, we're talking about there. It's an extremely uh, diverse fleet, so we represent a very large uh, pelagic freezer trawlers that's uh, fishing for large shoals of uh, mackerel, blue whiting, horse mackerel, um, right down to single-handed vessels fishing off beaches and, and out of creeks. So uh, we, we, we represent uh, everybody uh, and fishing for uh, quota species, but also non-quota species. Um, as some of your, uh, the participants in this webinar will be aware, um, there's a certain amount of uh, UK licenses and quota over the last 20 years while we've been in the single market have been purchased by uh, Anglo-Spanish, Anglo-Dutch, Anglo-Icelandic uh, companies and individuals. They are part of, part of the scene. They tend to be concentrated on particular uh, species. Um, so uh, that's really um, who we, uh, we represent. Um, in terms of um, the, the, the themes tonight of marine protected areas, Brexit and, and the fisheries bill. Um, and the title, uh, Sea of Scandals, uh, obviously uh, designed to, uh, by a journalist to generate uh, interest and, and, and I'm sure it's been very successful. Um, but, you know, that is, is very much part and parcel of this catastrophe narrative that um, is often attached to uh, to fishing um, and fish stocks. Yet, um, and Elspeth touched on this, all the scientific evidence, um, so this is not just me speaking, this is uh, the, uh, the authoritative international peer-reviewed uh, scientists uh, in International Council for Exploration of the Seas. All the evidence suggests that actually um, the trends are, are quite contrary to us going in a downward spiral uh, uh, to extinction. Um, the, the reality is that um, uh, fishing pressure has been halved since uh, around about the year 2000. I'll concede that um, the 1990s were um, a basket case. Um, we got everything wrong. Common fisheries policy, uh, was complicit in increasing fishing capacity, uh, providing grants and loans. There was an expansion of the fleet. Uh, there was rank overfishing. Nobody could be profitable on the quotas. There was over quota landings, uh, illegality. The science went into a tailspin. But um, after the fleet was right-sized to um, largely through decommissioning, um, what we've seen um, because fishing pressure has been reduced, we've seen the biomass of the main commercial stocks increasing steadily. And yes, there are a few outliers, North Sea cod, for example, but there are particular reasons for that. Um, the distribution of cod is moving northwards by about 12 kilometers uh, uh, per year. Um, and, and that is, um, that is uh, pretty much the explanation for what's happening with, with cod. But the big picture is actually of um, fisheries right across the Northeast Atlantic. Uh, so let's focus down, you know, we've got the global picture with those big catastrophic numbers, but if we focus down on what is actually happening in our fisheries, they're not doing too badly. They could, we could do better, certainly. Um, but what we have is steadily increasing fish stocks towards maximum sustainable yield, something like 75, 80% of stocks are already fished at maximum sustainable yield. yield, uh, yield. Even discards, which was the, um, the bete noir of the fishing industry and uh, uh, ultimately uh, ended in the EU landings obligation. Uh, even before that, the EU landings obligation uh, was introduced, uh, discard, the trains and discards have been falling very dramatically by over 90% in the North Sea uh, groundfish fishery. Um, and and I, I'm, I'd be very happy to talk about other major initiatives, um, uh, particularly the, the, the Catch Cleaner UK initiative, which is all about finding ways uh, through collaboration between scientists, uh, fishers and fisheries managers, 
how to reduce un unwanted in-cap. So nobody is suggesting um, that we are all the way there yet. Um, but the, the notion that we are going in the wrong direction is very prevalent in the media um, and, as I say, is contrary to the, 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 the evidence. Um, I was very struck by, in your film, uh, where, where the um, Ullapool uh, children, I think it was Maya, um, said, you know, we have to think about these issues logically, and I completely agree with that. Um, and one of the features of a logical approach is to pay attention to the evidence and just not make things up. Um, and so that, that's one of the reasons why um, in the, we very much welcome uh, in the fisheries bill that policy should be evidence-based. Evidence so um, I think it's also, I'd like to just put out there that there are essentially in, in broad terms, um, there are two ways we can approach fisheries management. Uh, this, is, um, this is perhaps my experience over, over a long time, but we can either do it through legislation, a kind of top-down prescriptive legislation, uh, necessarily pretty blanket measures, um, one-size-fits-all kind of approach. Uh, and then we just rely on the, uh, the policemen, the, the enforcement authorities to enforce those rules. Now, the experience of, of the common fisheries policy is that kind of approach doesn't really work. Um, it doesn't deliver. Uh, there are unintended consequences, um, not surprisingly, because the, the measures aren't uh, designed uh, by people who, who are involved in the fisheries. Uh, once they're in place, they're very difficult to adjust. The alternative to that kind of top-down uh, blanket approach is a kind of co-management uh, approach where the key people in the room are the, the people who fish, um, the, the fishery scientists who can help provide good management information on which to base decisions, um, and, and the fisheries managers. Um, very much focused on evidence. If you don't have good information, you will not make good management decisions. So it's all about getting uh, good information. And our um, understanding of the fisheries bill is that we have, for the first time, um, outside of the common fisheries policy, um, a framework there that will allow us to design and implement species specific management plans in an agile and flexible way. And, we, and when we get it wrong, and we will get it wrong because fisheries management is really complicated. When we get it wrong, we can change, move, change direction and, 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 uh, and change our policies. So I think um, uh, turning um, I think to, to what maybe you want to talk about, um, marine protected areas. I mean, I think the fishing industry understands and acknowledges that um, uh, marine protected areas have an important role to play um, to protect vulnerable uh, ecosystems to uh, habitats um, and, and species. Uh, but they are not a panacea and they're often presented uh, by NGOs in campaign mode as, as exactly that, a panacea. They're not very effective at protecting highly mobile uh, species. Um, but nevertheless, we, we understand uh, that there is a need for marine protected areas. We thought, certainly in England, we thought we had an understood process uh, for introducing marine protected areas uh, where they, would, they were designated and then there would be uh, evidence put forward on which um, appropriate management measures would be would be based, and we've we, we're into that process. We're into into the um, uh, the process of, a, of of designating and designing effective management uh, measures for MPAs. Um, that that takes a little bit of time, um, and I can understand why people may be uh, impatient. But all of this takes place against the background of the, the big change that I, that I mentioned earlier, an enormous reduction in fishing pressure, an enormous reduction in fishing um, uh, uh, mort uh, mortality, the technical term, and the stocks coming, coming back up. So, you know, the big, the big picture is, um, yes, there's more to, to be done, but, you know, this catastrophe narrative and the campaign uh, the campaigns that are 
that are based on that kind of thinking really don't help. Um, what we need is a proper dialogue between uh, that, that, that is based on evidence, not hearsay, and uh, that, that can provide us with, with a, uh, a way forward. Um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that, I think. Many thanks, Barry. Um, yeah, thanks for that. I've just got one quick question for you, which is prompted partly by seeing some of Callum Roberts' research. He's the Professor of Marine Biology at York. Um, and I guess he makes the point that your sen what, the sense of whether fish stocks are returning and doing better and so on is partly based on the baseline you choose. So I've, I've, I've looked at the State of Nature report for, the, um, for this year and basically you're 100% right that many demersal species are, are, are coming back in, in quite, quite strongly compared to the 1990s. If you were to look back at the seas as they were in say the 19th or 18th century, um, Robert's point is that something like 90% of the life has gone from the seas around Britain. Um, and so the, the small changes we're seeing now are relatively tiny fluctuations compared to what should be there. So I wonder how, do you, how you'd respond to that uh, point about the baseline you choose really being the uh, determinant of uh, what kind of judgments you make. Um, yeah, I mean the 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 the, the, the biggest change in, in human society is the you know, the the, um, the introduction of farming, the, ne the the Neolithic revolution, and we have been having an enormous as a species been having an enormous impact on the planet ever since. Um, fishing uh, is not exempt from that. Every every fishing method has uh, an environmental uh, footprint. Um, that footprint needs to be managed, completely accept that. But on the other side of the equation, we're providing food and fishing uh, actually has uh, one of the, the lowest uh, carbon footprint forms of food production. It is a, a, form, a form of food production that has the lowest uh, uh, carbon uh, footprint. You know, one of the arguably the, the most significant um, environmental metric for uh, our our planet. So I think um, what I would say is, yeah, you can look at these things in, in a kind of one-dimensional approach, um, but what um, I, I think we have to do is look at it in the round. Elspeth was quite right. Sustainability is, is about the environment, but it's also about social and economic uh, dimensions. And a part of that is about um, the, the, the food systems and uh, that, that, that we, choose, we choose. So yeah, you know, you can switch, switch the tap off and uh, let's not have any, any more fishing, but then the alternative then would be to, uh, to use food production systems that, uh, based on terrestrial uh, uh, production that have, have, a, have a greater uh, ecological uh, consequence there. It's all about balance. It's all about getting the balance right. And that's why, um, uh, you know, a kind of one dimensional focus, campaigning focus um, on one species or one, um, uh, 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 one management measure. Uh, for example, uh, putting forward marine protected areas uh, uh, as, a, uh, as, the, as the primary way to manage uh, highly mobile fish stocks. Well, that's nonsense. There are better tools to do that. Um, total Barry, Barry, I'm just going to stop you there just because of time, not because I'm not interested. Um, so, um, and, and just to um, uh, do a little bit of housekeeping as it were, uh, there is a facility to ask questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of, mo of your screens. If people want to put questions We'll be coming to those after our final speaker, Charles Clover, has had his say. Um, Charles, are you ready to roll? And can you hear me? Yeah, I'm not quite sure what point I meant to uh, dispute um, what uh, previously. You mean you have too many to dispute, or that you? Uh... Well, well, no. I, I, I um, we, we, we are Blooming Foundation. We're a, we're a, a charity that works with fishermen um, and has marine reserves, which. Uh, marine uh, reserves which fishermen are very pleased to fish in and where uh, they catch more than they would have done before because they're protected. So I think there's a lot of um, nonsense being talked. 
Um, but there is a particular piece of nonsense which the, the, I read on a briefing to the House of Lords and I've now heard Elspeth say, which is that you've got to balance the three pillars of sustainability. That is utter right or utter tripe. You, you depend upon, and this is what the Sustainable Development Goals say. So this is, defra has got that wrong if they've been saying this. The, 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 uh, the biosphere is what we base everything on. Uh, we, we, we cannot have society living in places on the shore unless we have uh, the, the biosphere. Uh, if we've screwed it up, then, then there is no, going to be no society and no economy. Uh, society is based on the, on the bio, biosphere and, and, and uh, the economy on that. It's called the Sustainable Development Goals wedding cake. That is, the, that is the current definition of sustainability. The one sits on the other, sits on the other. So you can't balance them out. You have to, you can apportion them once you've decided how much of the biosphere you can take and how much you need to leave in the sea, uh, you can apportion them between society and uh, then decide how you're going to build a, the most effective economy on it. Uh, but you can't balance those goals. And DEFRA has got it wrong. They've been told they've got it wrong. And it's not the current SDG thinking. So I just needed to say that because that's quite an important intellectual point. I was going to say that, uh, well, actually, Jonathan, you stole half the things I was going to say anyway, so I, wasn't, I won't go back. There, there are astonishing, um, we, we need to, 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 to uh, make quite clear that Brexit is a, 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 a turning point, could be, is going to be a turning point, which, whether it's up or down. Um, but it, 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 more than most of the other things, from a completely objective and whichever way you voted point of view, uh, you know, we have an opportunity to get it right which for at least 40 years, and you could argue for centuries, uh, you know, we haven't been. Um, it is shown that if, you know, seabeds and, and seas and species who pass over them uh, are given a chance to recover, you know, marine life uh, floods back faster than we could have dared hope. There are examples of that, very few of them around the world, but where we have marine reserves, they exist. Um, and where we have good fisheries management. I tend to agree with Barry on that quite regularly. Um, but you know, we have a situation where um, we don't have the herring anymore. We don't have the, 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 the bluefin tuna, or at least very few of them in the North Sea. You know, we are at a, at a, at a reduced uh, uh, level. We don't have massive spur dog, tope, smooth hound, long fin, blue, in Paul Beagle, Thresher, Mako, Great White Sharks, which Oliver Goldsmith saw in the 18th century. We, we catch a sixth of the amount that fishing uh, vessels with all their technological gear catch a sixth of the amount that sailing boats caught in the 1880s. There are fewer fish. So let's not kid ourselves. But the point is, we could bring them back if we tried hard enough, we did this properly. The problem about modern fisheries science and the problem about modern fisheries people is they're trying to look at what happened in the 90s when they're not looking, they're not being ambitious enough, in my view. Um, it, it, and, and I don't think that's acceptable anymore because in the course of the, uh, the, the, the fisheries bill, we have discovered, we've been told for the first time by the government that the, 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 the right to fish is a public right and that the, the, the fisheries are, uh, are owned by the crown on behalf of all of us. Well, if they're owned by all of us, then why is 55% of, of English quota owned by foreigners and why is pretty much 95% of it owned by industrial fleets, which are arguably more um, damaging and destructive to the ecosystem than the inshore and, and slightly offshore fleets. Why, why is that? I don't think that's a sustainable position. So the Brexit has within it these great dynamos of change, which, which will happen willy-nilly if you accept that it is the public right and this is a public asset, because public assets are better managed in other circumstances, whether it's the Crown Estate or the roads, you know, um, the, the, what the public wants uh, gets taken account of rather more. Um, in, in terms of what people have said about uh, fisheries management, 
Um, I would point out that we're coming out of the common fisheries policy, which was supposed to have all stocks um, back to sustainable levels by, by 2020. It has signally failed to do that. Um, and uh, I think 46% of stocks are currently overfished in the year that we were meant to stop overfishing by. Uh, well, we're out of the common fisheries policy, but the, the common fisheries policy is failing because Europe's politicians fail to observe their own laws. How is it going to be after Brexit in the fisheries bill? Um, will they be ambitious enough? I mean, Elspeth's absolutely right. It's all, a, uh, all down to fisheries management plans. And um, it is very important that we consult everybody and that these are co-management and that we don't do top down. But we are totally aware of that because we work with fishermen in Lime Bay, a, a, a marine protected area. But the, the killer point on fisheries management, if I may just finish that off before we get on to, to marine protected areas, is this. Um, Rainer Froser, um, a, a very distinguished German scientist, looked at 400 European fish stocks and he was amazed to discover that, you know, we catch 8.8 .8 million um, uh, uh, tons of fish a year in the whole of Europe. But when he did the numbers, what surprised him was that we could catch an additional 5 million tons if we only managed them properly. Now, obviously it's worse as you go further south, but that is also true in the North, uh, North Atlantic. We would get that plenty back. We might even get back to Oliver Goldsmith if we set quotas slightly lower for a couple of years and then obeyed uh, European law, says MSY, maximum sustained yield, no more. And, and we would have that bounty back um, roughly in five to 10 years. So why do we do it? Um, profits for fishermen would improve by, would double in that time span. So, you know, the industry is always trying to look at tomorrow. If we were to look at 15 years hence and decide how to get a better result, um, maybe we should even devise a blue bond to make that an investable proposition. Maybe that's what the other speakers want to do too. I don't know. I'd like to hear. So we better get on to... Um, to, to I'm yes. just going to just jump in there and say, if you can, we want to get some questions in. So if you can finish off in two or three minutes, I'll be grateful. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm just taking on the points. Um, so if the sea is going to be managed as a public asset, then we should aim for healthy seas, not picking amid the ruins, um, in my view. Um, healthy seas are in our interest, but particularly in, in, in the interest of fishing communities. We've just had this very good report, uh, which shows that if we increase the number of protected areas, we would have by 5% in the world, we'd have 20% more fish uh, to catch, which seems quite important. So I, I'm, I'm really positive about this and I'm really positive for the, for the fishing industry. But you know, we need to, the only way you invest in the sea is by taking less out of it and it grows and you can then catch more. So we need to have a system for doing that. Um, but we, we have made a lot of mistakes in managing fish. So that's why you need marine protected areas. Marine protected areas work. Look at Lime Bay. This is a protected area of a sort. It's a European protected area. It's quite a large one. It's the largest in the UK or was at one time, uh, where trawls and dredges are banned. And there is an explosion of life. 42 fishermen fish there with pots and set nets, according to a voluntary code. One fisherman recently described an interview as uh, a gold mine. The, we are putting out a, a, a film about Lime Bay and the win-win uh, project between conservationists and fishermen that we have run there with them, co-managed for the last 10 years on uh, Tuesday next week. Um, so I just want to skip to this fact that, you know, at a national level, Britain's doing wonderfully well uh, championing the ambition of protecting 30% of the world's oceans by 2030. It seems certain people on this call don't seem to know that. That is our national target. Um, but you know, you have to accept that you know while we do uh, uh, Kristin de Kuna, which we uh, help uh, fundraise for, uh, many other people did, and and Ascension, these huge, um, fully protected reserves out there in the Atlantic. You know, we need to make protection, mean protection, 
nearer to home. It was out there in the, because of the common fisheries policy and the confusion uh, and, and the fact that uh, fishing trumps environmental law in European waters, we have not been applying any management to our offshore marine reserves and that's not good enough. And places like the Dog Bank designated about 2012, talked about for a lot longer than that probably actually in, 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 in law uh, should have been protected for earlier, earlier than that. Um, no management whatsoever. An entirely nuclear arsenal of every single fishing method has been uh, uh, applied to them, including pulse trawling, which was uh, the, even the European Commission now accepts illegal. There are, more, there are more fishing vessels in marine protected areas than outside them. That is a report of, uh, uh, published last year. This is ludicrous. Charles, Charles, that's a great place to end, if you don't mind. Not, yep. again, because we're not interested. We are, but we're just short on time. Um, I think it's possible for anyone listening to put their hands up and I can see them on my screen and uh, allow them to ask a question. Um, but just while people are figuring out that technology, Charles, I'll just put one quick question to you. And this is hopefully, this is a massive question, which I'm sure you can answer very fast, which is what should Britain do about the quota that is now held, the UK quota now held by foreign uh, by foreign boats and foreign skippers. Is there, is there something simple and easy we should do, maybe in the long term, to bring that back, or should we simply keep that as the status quo? I think the, the historic um, misallocation was really between the offshore and the inshore fleet. I think that's the real problem. Um, I, I don't want to say that, you know, foreigners can't own British companies, um, but I do think that they've got um, uh, to show that they are returning some investment into the, the, the UK Treasury. I, there, are, there are lots of fishing vessels, and some of them are on the Dogger Bank, because I've been having a look, which, which return nothing, no benefit whatsoever to the UK Treasury for fishing in British waters. They don't pay any licenses, they don't pay any taxes, they land on the continent. Now that must stop because that's not doing UK Limited any good. Thank you, Charles. Um, we're going to go to Jacqueline Gibson, who is, um, who's put her hand up. Uh, Jacqueline, can you unmute? I'm not sure you can actually speak yet. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, before you speak, just a quick warning. Given the time, we'd really appreciate everyone uh, who's asking a question to do so quickly rather than to make long statements. So okay. um, on, in the hope you can manage that, please go ahead. Yes, well, hopefully you can bear with me. Um, regarding fishing in Irish waters, that Norwegian fishing vessels are coming in, um, kind of hoovering up, if you like, Small Sorry, Jackie, I'm just going to stop you. Just could you briefly introduce yourself, just who you Sorry. are and what who yes. you And um, uh, if you want any particular panellists to respond, please do address your question to them. So Jacqueline Gibson, um, I, I'm a sustainability consultant and I used to work with the LOX agency um, in Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland, a cross-border EU funded kind of project to help protect fisheries both sides of the border. I um, come from a conservation background. Um, and what else? Yes, an advocate That's fine. for That's fine. We get it. transparency of food and things. So, um, as I mentioned, there are Norwegian fishing boats coming in. Speak. I'm, I'm actually. I grew up in the largest fishing village in Northern Ireland called Kilkeel. And um, so, boats are coming into the Northern, sorry, Republic of Ireland waters, fishing large quantities of small fish. Um, as I mentioned, these are Norwegian-owned fish fishing boats. This doesn't happen. It's not allowed to happen in Norway. Nets are too big so the small fish get away and rejuvenate and they're not allowed to fish for fish meal and that is the issue they're 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 hoovering this up to go straight to plants that are making fish meal for salmon farms which are 50 percent owned by norwegian or 51 percent owned by norwegian 49 percent owned by simon coveney's brother so um coming into ireland with you know low corporation tax buying up business influencing government to pass laws. So my question is, why is this being allowed to happen in the Irish waters? Should such licenses be repatriated to local shores and fishermen? And how could, why is salmon being certified as sustainable 
with by withholding the story behind the food supply chain? Okay, that's a great sense? question. I suspect the answer might lie in there having been once a trade-off which allowed British boats into perhaps Norwegian waters, but I'm just guessing there. Elspeth, does that sound like something that you're familiar with? Because I suspect it possibly is. Well, I don't um, have much involvement with fisheries in, in Ireland. I, I represent industry in Scotland. No, I was but thinking of the trade-off though. What I'm thinking this actually, I think what the situation that Jacqueline's described is something that will be um, permitted under the, the common fisheries policy, whereby the EU has, has an annual negotiations with Norway about the exchange of access to each other's waters and access to fishing opportunities. And it may be that the situation that Jacqueline's described, and I, I'm not familiar with the detail of it, but that may simply be a, um, a manifestation of, of, of those negotiations that happened between the EU and, 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 um, and Norway. And because the, the UK is leaving the common fisheries policy, that's exactly the sort of situation that, that we want to be able to determine for ourselves in future. We want to be able to negotiate separately with the EU. We want to be able to negotiate separately with Norway in terms of who can come into our waters, what they can catch and what the rules are. So I think what Jacqueline's expressing there is some frustration that, um, that certainly some people in Ireland, probably parts of the um, possibly parts of the industry, possibly um, society feels that these, these vessels are um, are not fishing in ways that, they, that, that the Irish people would like them to be. Um, and there's a limit to how much that can be changed because of the rules of the CFP. So I think it's a, it's a really good example, actually, of why the CFP should allow the UK to determine who can come in, who can catch what in our waters and what the rules will be. Yeah, so there could be a, it could be a, a, a cure in Brexit. Charles, what Jacqueline has, has described is fishing at the bottom of the food chain, isn't it? How serious an impact might that kind of um, that kind of fishing have? I'm not uh, wonderfully clear uh, what 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 the stock is or or how that is happening. I'm afraid I just don't know enough about what the Norwegians are up to in that context. And and uh, as with your other two speakers, I like to base everything I say on science, science and, and knowledge of the of the stock. So I can't help with that. But um, Fishing at the base of the food chain um, is is problematic in a, in a in a mixed fishery. It was problematic in the Norwegian uh, cod fishery in the Barents Sea that uh, apparently precipitated a crash of the of the, 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 the cod stock when the capelin got hammered. It's generally um, not a good idea to fish um, a, a forage fish if you want to have a a valuable fin fish fishery. That's what Daniel Paul has always said. Um, Good. Okay, Charles, I'm just going to move on swiftly now. Um, Barry, uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll jump over you, as I think Elspeth covered that quite well. But um, I wonder if we can move to Ruth Greenaway. Ruth, can you hear me and can you unmute? Ruth, are you there? Ah, hello there. Um, I'm sitting oh, with Ruth. Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's she's right Ruth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, my partner's um, registered for us, but we've been listen, listening along and enjoying it uh, a great deal. Um, it's quite insightful. Uh, but I know we're short of time, so I'll get straight to the point. Um, looking at how you've got ghost nets and all the detritus that's left by uh, fishermen on the seabed, which will basically be death traps for, well, 600 years or more, wouldn't it be a sensible move to make uh, plastic or a man made fish? Uh, fishing nets illegal at this stage, make them um, or compel them to be made out of natural fibers, which will uh, decompose. And that way you'll have uh, an end to the factory fish uh, ships because you won't have the four mile long uh, fishing lines. And you'll have a flourishing of small boats because people will still want to fish. So that will be a much more sustainable way because you'll have a, a much higher layer of um, employment and you'll have a uh, much safer seas once you've got rid of all that horrible plastic. Um, Barry, that sounds like something your members would care a great deal about. I wonder what you think of that idea. I know, I, th I think um, the, the heightened sensitivities to uh, plastics in, in the marine environment, I think um, 
have led to a uh, reevaluation of fishing gears. What could be, uh, you know, how could gears be um, uh, redesigned in, in order to reduce plastic waste? Waste, and I think that um, there are a number of initiatives underway um, under that heading. Also, we run, and I think the Scottish industry also run uh, fishing for litter. So when uh, fishermen in their nets uh, uh, catch um, litter, plastic bags, etc., cetera, um, they're encouraged to take them ashore and there's facilities on shore to, uh, to receive and dispose of, of, of those, recycle uh, those. So, um, th th there are, um, there are not, are not, not only, in that sense, not only are fishermen taking home uh, their nets that they no longer have use for, but they're also taking home other people's plastic waste from the marine environment. So, you know, there, there's a number of, of, of strands there. Um, I think, you know, the, 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 the point about um, small boats and big boats uh, my view is that you need both small boats and big boats. Uh, the very large um, shoaling species like um, like mackerel and herring and blue whiting. Um, and incidentally, I think that probably you, the, the previous question uh, was in relation to blue whiting, which is caught in uh, in, in Irish waters. Um, uh, you need large, efficient vessels uh, to, to fish for those efficiently and safely. You know, you're talking about very large shoals uh, far offshore. Um, it makes sense to harvest those with uh, large vessels. But the, the, the quid pro quo for that is you can't have too many large vessels. So, you know, in the UK fleet, um, vessels of that description, I think it, the licenses are limited to 25. You're only talking about 20, 25. You're talking about, when you're talking about small vessels, you're talking about um, three and a half thousand uh, in, in England. So I think um, it's horses for courses. Um, you, need, you, you need big middle-sized, big vessels, middle-sized vessels and small vessels. Uh, it depends on the fishery. It depends how many uh, vessels you're talking about depends on the resource. This is why within the fisheries bill, this idea of um, fisheries management plans at the right spatial level, at the right uh, targeting the right, um, now a fishery might be um, a species widely dispersed or it might be a group of species. Um, <coughs> it, it really rather depends on, on the circumstances. And I think, um, you know, part of the answer to these questions, it, it, it very much depends um, on, on the specific fisheries. Harry, very quickly, let me just drag you back to one of the key points in that question, which was the, the fact that fishing gives you a short-term gain, a net full of fish, but it leaves a, a very long-lasting legacy of plastic all over the ocean. And although some fishermen may remove what they find, there's still a great deal of plastic in the ocean. Um, his point was essentially that, the, um, that can't we make nets out of something a little more which will it decompose naturally and why do we have to keep using so much plastic? Elspeth, do you want to come in on that one? I see you waving your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to make a point. Um, I, I can't remember the statistics off the top of my head, but I think the, the majority of, of plastic that's actually in the ocean is from terrestrial sources, but obviously there is, um, there is waste from, from um, users of the sea too. Um, but I just wanted to make the point about um, vessel gear and, and, and trying to find better ways of doing things. And I think that's a really good point. And um, for example, in our pelagic fleet, which are the, the larger boats, the ones Barry was describing that, that go and catch the, the large shoals of fish, um, they, uh, they are becoming increasingly um, good and focused on recycling their gear. So when, when their nets um, have reached the end of their useful life, they go for recycling. And in fact, just one of my colleagues today was sending me a picture um, from one of the ports in northeast of Scotland showing uh, nets being loaded onto a lorry to go away for recycling. So I think, um, you know, the industry does recognise that, 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 that we don't want to be leaving things behind. We don't want to be polluters of the sea. And, and you know, that there are moves afoot to try and improve 
to try and increase the amount of material that can be recycled to make sure that as much material um, material is being brought back to shore. And you know, I think I think this is a, a work in progress. You know, there's there's more to do, absolutely. But I think it's really encouraging to see the focus now that's that parts of the fleet are already putting on to recycling their gear. Thanks, Elspeth. Charles, in uh, David Attenborough's documentaries, plastic in the form of nets, but also terrestrial plastic was one of the most emotive sites and um, it encouraged a huge response from the public. What's your perception of the scale of that problem? Is it as, is it as bad? Is it, is it the key issue that we're facing or a key issue? Or has it been um, pushed to the forefront by emotive pictures and video? I'm told that at Ghost Gear, um, kills four times more marine life than, than, than other macro plastic. So it's significant. Um, I, I think that you know, we're all horrified by the amount of plastic ending up in the, in the oceans. And um, uh, I do think fishermen can play their part, do frequently play their part, have, have conscience about it. But what we should do in terms of uh, re-engineering it uh, is beyond my competence. Okay, thanks Charles. Now um, we're running out of time very rapidly. I'm, I've got one question has come up on the written questions, which is quite interesting in the context of Britain and what's happening in Britain's oceans uh, in terms of our move towards renewable energy. And the question is from Pete Murray, who says, does the burgeoning number of wind farms around the coast provide de facto protected areas? Um, that's kind of a practical question. I, I wonder if Barry, if you feel able to address that one. Um, What wind farms do and um, marine protected areas, depending on um, the, the management measures that, that apply, um, is cause uh, displacement effects. Um, that can be problematic um, because there, are, there is increasing competition for space. Um, at sea. Um, fishing opportunities tend to be concentrated in particular particular places. It's not quite, it's not, um, the, the ocean isn't the same all over in terms of abundance of fish, you know. Uh, it would maybe be nice if, if they were. Um, so I, I think the answer to this question is, um, you know, can wind farms, of which there is a huge um, expansion and, and projected more expansion. Can they provide reserves? Well, uh, at the moment, technically, um, vessels, uh, particularly using static gear, um, can fish in, in, in many of those areas. Um, trawler, trawlers find it difficult because of the, the kind of maneuver, maneuverability. So de facto, um, these are very large spaces that are denied uh, access to the more mobile kinds of, of fishing. Um, but I think this has to all be understood within the context of marine spatial planning. Uh, and where, you know, where can, you know, fishing doesn't have a monopoly of, of the seabed or, or the sea. We understand that. We have to find ways of coexisting uh, with marine renewables, um, with the, the many cables that come up, come across the um, the, the ocean, um, we uh, so really the, the question is about uh, marine spatial planning, um, about coexistence, about dialogue, um, and and maybe there are overlaps where our interests uh, coincide, but that that does take a lot of talking. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Barry. Now, uh, we're rapidly running out of time, and um, we've got two more things to do. One, the first one is, I'd just like to go around the three of you and ask what your hopes or vision might be for Britain's seas and the progress happening in them, say, 10 years hence. We'll be post-Brexit, we'll be post-Fisheries Bill, um, there'll be um, an entirely new regime in Britain's oceans, also including renewable energy. So, in brief, I wonder if each of you could set up what you hope we'd be seeing from that, adding in, of course, the impacts or benefits for our coastal communities. 
After we've done that, we're going to switch to a video sent in to us by the Ullapool Sea Savers, who are a group of uh, youngsters in Ullapool, Scotland, who featured in Prince William's A Planet for Us All, looking at their work in protecting their local marine environment. And that will be our, our closing video. So um, which of you would like to go first in just setting us a little bit of a vision? Elspeth, how do you feel? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, because I think it, it touches on a, a lot of the things that we've been talking about tonight. I think um, um, it would be great 10 years hence to find that we had um, lived, we'd lived through a period whereby the, with the work that we've been able to do under the new Fisheries Bill, the Fisheries Act, gives us exactly those sorts of fisheries management plans that we need, adaptive, innovative, responsive ways of managing fisheries so that we have healthy stocks, good fisheries, um, sustainable management, um, that we have, um, I think, got the f f f finding the right way forward in terms of that sort of spatial planning, some of those pressures on space in the sea for different, different activities that, that we've spoken about. Um, that we have, um, I hope, a, a greater recognition of the um, real importance that, that the industry can make to the production of um, a low-carbon low food source and, and, and recognition of the um, important contribution that we can make to reducing, uh, re reducing carbon footprint of our diet more generally. But I, I would love to see also that um, we could have uh, reduced even further the, the carbon footprint of of the of the fleet through innovative technology, for example, that, that that can drive that carbon footprint down even lower. So I think some of these things would be great to see ten years from now. Okay, Barry, your ten year vision. The first thing I wanted to say is in in, in doing a little background uh, reading for today, I found out that um, the carbon footprint for whitefish and pelagic uh, fisheries is lower than tofu, which was, um, uh, I thought, quite, quite illuminating, quite interesting. Um, but in terms of vision for 10 years, well, um, the negotiations that are currently underway ought to deliver uh, a much fairer quota balance for the UK. And on the back of that, uh, I think there's a lot that we can do for um, our coastal communities. Um, the Fisheries Bill has given us a much more agile um, fisheries policy, but it's only a framework, it's only a platform. Uh, there's a huge amount of work to, to, to be done. Um, I would hope that in 10 years we've got um, uh, a, a good tranche of fisheries plans in place, up and running, um, delivered through uh, co-management that you know, address those kind of very basic questions. Where are we now? You know, we need the information, the good sound information on which to um, manage our fish, manage our fisheries, and reduce the kind of um, uh, statistical avalanches that we, we we've kind of heard tonight. Where you know, well, where does that figure come from? Is it valid? Who who made it? What what interest? You know, uh, an agreed understanding of the information on which we're managing our fisheries. Um, the next question is, where do we want to be? I'm not really that interested in interminable um, discussions about maximum sustainable yield or economic yield. I'm more interested in moving in the right direction. If you continue to move in the right direction, that's much more important than arcane discussions about destination. And then the really key issue is um, how do we get there? What are the measures that will take us to where we need to go fishery by fishery? And I think the answer uh, for that lies in, in, in the dialogue, in the co-management, in the discussions between uh, fishers who are actually involved in those fisheries, uh, the fisheries scientists that help us understand what's going on, the trends, uh, and the fisheries managers, the fisheries administrators. So, uh, you know, I think that's, um, that, that would be my hope. Many thanks, Barry. Uh, Charles, so in 10 years time, will we have more fish in our waters and will we, might we have less Europeans? What do you think? I hope we have some uh, ambitious fisheries management plans by then, and they're actually working. Um, it would be nice to see that, like everybody else. I do think we'll need to reallocate quota, quite a lot of it, because the wrong people got it the first time. 
and it's very unfair. But I don't think we should just always talk about the sea and fishing because the sea is the, the ocean is the greatest carbon sink on the planet. And we haven't yet begun to run down um, exactly what the impact of the fishing industry actually is. But I would very much suspect that it is not as light uh, or, or heavier than, <laughs> light is, lighter than tofu, when you actually reckon in the, uh, the impact that trawling and dredging has on uh, the, the seabed, which has an, a capacity like rainforests to soak up carbon. If you, you know, mow a rainforest, it doesn't soak up carbon. It's the same is true of the seabed. We haven't got the numbers on that yet, but I think when we do, we will find that we do need to set aside large chunks of the sea or change our fishing techniques because of the impact on climate change that the fishing industry is having, but that we haven't measured yet. That's a fascinating point. I, it's something that could deserve an entire separate evening. Um, in the meantime, we are sadly curtailed for time and what I'd like to do is very quickly switch over to Luke Douglas Hume whose organisation Clear Public Space organised the event tonight. Luke, can you hear me and would you like to make a few closing comments? Uh, Jonathan, I don't think you can hear me. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you very well. Very good, very good. Thank you all for a great debate. This is so interesting, Charles, also about the longer term plan about the carbon sinks, I think is, is very important for us all. And Elsworth and Barry, thank you so much for putting the other side of the pro fishing industry compared to the MBA, MPAs in marine protected areas. Um, this is a great debate. Thank you very much indeed. And please follow us in the future for Environmental Frontline. We persuaded the Frontline to do environmental series of, uh, de of debates. Let's keep continu continuing this because the Frontline is all of our, our, the environment is all of our Frontline. Thank you all. Many thanks, Luke. And finally, um, we're going to try and do some technological wizardry and switch over to the video from the um, Ullapool youngsters. So bear with me while I switch you across. Thanks to all of you and especially our three panellists for coming uh, online tonight. It's been really interesting. Fisheries is an immensely complex subject. Every time I talk about it, I learn something new and I think I've learned something new from all three of you tonight. So bear with me, we're going to go to the Hollipool group and here we go. Jonathan, we're not getting the volume. Oh, really? That's annoying. In that case, do you want to try sharing yourself, Pranvera, or shall I? If you just, where well, there's very light volume, I unfortunately haven't been able to run it. Um, I think we might leave it in that case, unless you can share it from your screen. <laughs> I have not been able to. Can you share a link that actually works and we can all watch it uh, 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 in our own Any time? better? No. I'm um, sorry. Can you hear that? Nope. Okay. I think we might just um, have to leave that one then. Uh, but um, Pranvera, can we ask you to put it onto the frontline website below? We will. On the, um, event listing so that people can watch it for themselves. Um, I'm sorry that didn't work. It's, uh, we've all learned a lot about technology in the last year and I guess there are some things that technology still needs to learn from us and sharing those videos is probably one of them. So many thanks to all of you. Uh, I'm sorry we've only had an hour and a quarter but it's been fascinating and um, good night to everyone and especially to our panelists. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, good night.